Hi. Hello. You so, made it. Great. <laughs> so we have um, Martin Palmer today, and he will be speaking about uh, homology of configuration section spaces. Okay, so, well, thank you very much. And thanks, first of all, thank you very much for the uh, opportunity to speak here. Um, so yes, so I'll be talking about uh, configuration section spaces and their homology, and in particular, um, the homological stability for configuration section spaces. So what happens is the number of uh, particles in this, in this space goes to infinity. Um, and first of all, I should say this is uh, all joint work with Ulrika Tillman, and it's based on uh, two archive preprints from July. Uh, mostly I'll be talking about the first one and the second one will be, I'll be, I'll mention towards the end. Um, okay, so what are configuration section spaces? These are um, motivated by the following idea. So physically, uh, uh, if we want to consider somehow a model for particles moving in some kind of ambient manifold M and for simplicity, we will never, we will not allow collisions at all uh, today. Um, then a model for that is given by uh, the unordered configuration space on M. So mathematically, this is defined exactly like this. So uh, we take um, the subspace of uh, M to the N, the Cartesian product of N copies of M, where uh, all points are pairwise dis distinct and then quotient out by the natural action of the symmetric group. And as a set, it's just the set of uh, cardinality n subsets of m. And the topology is exactly such that as you move around continuously, points cannot collide. They just move around uh, using the topology of the manifold. Uh, so those are classical configuration spaces. Um, more generally, you might want to model some kind of physical system where the particles have some kind of internal parameter. Um, I'm not a physicist, so I. Uh, I can't say exactly what uh, kind of physical things could be modeled by this, but it could be, um, yeah, particles can have some kind of internal parameter that's, uh, e that's localized to each particle. And then this can be defined just by a slight extension of the definition of above um, by uh, just taking the Cartesian product with x to the n before quotienting by the symmetric group, and then take the quotient by the diagonal action. and as a, an element of this can be thought of just as uh, n unordered disjoint, uh, distinct particles in the manifold, and each particle has a label in X. And nothing is ordered, but you know which label belongs to which particle. So they're kind of local, it's local data in that sense. And then a more non-local thing that one can model, which is more what I'll be talking about today, is if you, instead of modeling uh, particles with parameters that belong to the particle, uh, it models particles, but there's some kind of field. Uh, they're coupled to some kind of field um, on M, which is either just a continuous map from M to something, or more generally a section of some bundle over M, um, which is allowed to be undefined, which is which is undefined at the particles. So this is quite often the case that you have some kind of field on the complement, and it's not necessarily possible to extend its definition to the particles themselves, like a gravitational field or something. Um, and so at least as a set, it's fairly clear what kind of uh, set this should be. It should be the set of, again, um, cardinality n subsets of the manifold together with a continuous map from the complement of that configuration to uh, x. And I think I've forgotten everywhere uh, to write that the configuration should always be in the interior of the manifold. That's what I always mean in the interior. Um, uh, and then yes, and then a uh, function from the complement of these, this configuration to x. And if you, instead of a bundle, then it, instead of a continuous map to a fixed space x, you can have a section of some bundle that we've fixed over m. Uh, this doesn't yet explain how to topologize them, but I'll explain that in a moment when I give the more precise definition. Um, and in particular, I'll be interested in um, stabilization for these kinds of spaces. So what happens as the number of particles goes to infinity. So, uh, right. 
I will always be assuming that the manifold has non-empty boundary. So there's some piece of boundary where you can somehow push in a new particle together with additional data. And also to make sense of this, we need to assume that um, all the fields are prescribed on some disk in the boundary. So schematically, that's the manifold. We have some, uh, so it's d-dimensional, we have some d minus one dimensional disk in the boundary. And then we know that uh, the field is equal to something fixed on this boundary, so we can easily extend it on something, um, on some little piece of a column neighborhood in which we add one more point and either a label or a field on a complement. And we get all of these kinds of stabilization maps in the same, the same way. Okay, so this gives us a natural way of uh, stabilizing these spaces. Um, and uh, classically, what's known is there's a lot known for these spaces and there's less known for these uh, configuration mapping and configuration section spaces. So classical result of McDuff and Siegel from the 70s is that the, for the unordered simple configuration spaces with no extra data, um, these stabilization maps make them into a homologically stable sequence. So the nth map from the, uh, from the nth space to the n plus first space induces isomorphisms on homology in a certain range of degrees. And the point is that it, the range of degrees in which it is an isomorphism uh, diverges as n goes to infinity. So in a bigger and bigger range of degrees, these become more and more similar homologically and in particular uh, have the same homology as the co-limit. Um, and this is uh, this has been generalized to the case where we have uh, internal parameters, so configurations uh, with labels in some space X um, by Randall Williams in 2013. Um, and he proved that uh, the same homological stability phenomenon holds if the label space is path connected. Okay, and it's uh, an important point that uh, it's really necessary for X to be path connected. That can easily be seen. It's the first remark. Um, because if the space is not path connected, then you can easily see that the zero homology of the configuration space grows unboundedly. Uh, because the, the path components of the configuration space are then indexed by the uh, unordered n tuples of uh, path components of x. And as n goes to infinity, that grows unboundedly. Um, and a similar thing will happen for configuration mapping spaces. Is, so if we don't... Uh, isn't this somewhat like a fake issue that if you like restrict to particular connected components, then you would get um, homological stability. Like if I zero of X has two components, then you just need them like, as you change components, the isomorph should be isomorphism in a range depending on like min of how many like particles are labeled in each thing. Uh, well, I guess you have to, you can only add, yeah, okay. Uh, I guess you, this is, you can look at it one part component at a time, but I think this is not so different to uh, assuming that, uh, to looking at one path component of X at a time. So I guess, yeah, you're right. You can take mixed configurations where some particles are labeled by different path components of X, and then the stability range will always depend on uh, the N in the stable in the stability theorem will be the number of particles that are already labeled by the path component of X that you are labeling the new point with. Um, uh, yeah, so I think, yeah, you're right. The only problem in some sense is H0. Um, but this somehow motivates why we want to look at one path component of this configuration space at a time, because uh, if we don't do that, then it's just going to blow up already on H0. Um, and then the, yeah, the point is that the same thing generically happens for configuration mapping spaces as well, um, because the local behavior of the field near one of the particles um, there are different, I mean, there are local behaviors um, 
that you can't get from one to the other by a continuous path. And so these will somehow force the number of path components to also blow up in general, not, not in, every, in, in every case, but in general, this will be the case. So uh, the number of, in other words, the number of path components of configuration mapping spaces is in general uh, not eventually constant as n goes to infinity. Um, and so we'll want to have some kind of control over the, the monodromy around a particle or what could also be called the charge of the field at a particle meaning just its local behavior in some infinitesimal region. Um, okay, so that's, now I'll give the, the pro precise definition and also define certain subspaces where we control, the, we somehow put some limit on what kind of monodromy we allow. So the, the definition of configuration mapping spaces was uh, already given by Ellenberg, Venkatesh and Westerland um, in their preprint from 2012. Um, <clears throat> so first I'll give the definition for configuration mapping spaces and then I'll give um, not the full definition but an idea of the definition for configuration section spaces, um, which is, uh, as far as we're aware, a new definition. So for configuration mapping spaces, as I already said, as a set we want them to uh, correspond to this data. So a configuration in M of size N and uh, in the interior of M, and then a continuous map from the complement of the configuration to X. And as I said before, we want to have some, uh, we want to prescribe what the field looks like on some disk in the boundary of M. So let's just say that that sends that disk to the base point of X. Um, and then to topologize it, uh, we can define, we can, redefine it to be this space and then it's not too hard to see there's a natural bijection between these two sets and so we can use the topology of this space to topologize this space and this is the somehow interpretation of what how to think of it and this is the formal definition that makes it clear what the topology is so namely we fix once and for all one configuration in the interior of m and then we take the mapping space from the complement of that to x we cross it with the diffeomorphism group of M, fixing the boundary, and then we quotient by the diagonal action of, of this, which is the subgroup of diffeomorphisms that fix the configuration setwise. It naturally acts on the mapping space by precomposition, and it also naturally acts on this because it's just a subgroup, so by right multiplication. Um, and then it's not too hard to see that this, uh, this is in bijection with that, and so we, this gives us a topology on the configuration mapping space. Um, and then a slightly more subtle definition is to restrict the charge or the monodromy around the particles. So we now fix an extra datum, which is a subset, uh, a set of unbased homotopy classes of maps from the D minus one sphere to X. And then we define the subspace, right? The configuration mapping space with charges constrained to live in C is the subspace um, where the following condition is satisfied. So this is a picture of the manifold and the blue particles. And then it should have the condition that for any embedding of a disk that contains, whose image contains one of these particles in the interior and is disjoint from the rest, uh, we can restrict that to the boundary of the disk. And when we restrict it to the boundary of the disk, that will uh, not intersect the particles. And so we can compose it with F and that gives us a map from the D minus one sphere to X, and we just ask for that to be in one in one of the homotopy classes that we chose. Um, and yeah, there's a slight uh, technicality that we should always insist that this is orientation preserving this embedding uh, if M is orientable, and if it's not, we don't insist any condition. Okay, so this somehow is basically making precise the idea that we want to uh, see as a collection of local behaviors of uh, continuous function in a neighborhood of a point, and we just choose a subset of those which we want to allow. Uh, okay, and this is somehow can be interpreted as the charge of a particle um, moving in this field, and we constrain that to lie in one of these homotopy classes. Okay, so that, that's the definition of configuration mapping spaces. It's slightly more, uh, 
slightly more tricky to make sense of the right notion of this uh, the charge in the case of a configuration section space because um, we don't just have a map to a fixed space but it's a section of a bundle over m and we can't canonically identify the fiber over each possible disk with uh, x other unless the bundle is trivial so in this case we do something slightly more slightly more careful uh, this is not the, the full definition but just the idea um, so there's an, there's a construction that given any bundle over a manifold uh, it takes in a bundle so it takes in a bundle over a manifold and it outputs a covering space over that manifold uh, where the points in the total space of the covering space are to be thought of as a point in the manifold equipped with a germ of a section of the bundle near p meaning in a neighborhood of p but not at p okay so it's germs of sections on punctured neighborhoods of of p uh, and it's not too hard to see that that's the covering space over m and moreover any configuration section of this bundle uh, induces a section of this covering space right because a configuration section is a section that's defined except at some isolated points but because it's defined everywhere except at isolated points it's still the case that in a punctured neighborhood of every point you have a section so you get uh, you can define a section of this covering space. Um, and then the charge of this system, so consisting of points and the, and the section and the complement, is defined to be this induced section of this covering space. And then restricting the charge means restricting the, we pass to a subset of these possible sections of this configuration, of this covering space, and we just take those that have this, an induced section in, in that uh, subset. So it's a bit more abstract, but in the, if you check for the case of a trivial bundle, it exactly reduces to the previous definition. Um, <clears throat> so are there any questions about this so far? So I have a question about the topology of mm -hmm. this, I mean, of this total space of uh, sigma of psi. So if, if I take a uh, a germ of a section which does not extend near p is it true that anyway in a neighborhood of it i will see only germs that do extend on the on the on the center of the neighbor okay. because I mean, I, I have a point P in the manifold, a small neighborhood, U, mm -hmm. and then a section defined in, on U minus P. And this would be a point in sigma of psi, right? Yes. I mean, you, you can represent the point by such data. And then mm -hmm. you, I guess, a neighborhood of this point would be, you take P prime in U, and you take the same section, which happens to be defined also at P prime. Yes. Uh, I would, I would, is, is this the okay? case? Do I understand correctly? So uh, my question is whether I understand correctly the topology or, or, or it's yeah, something. Well, I, think a, I think a basis is, I think, yeah, you, I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. I think a basis is given by you take, um, yeah, I think a neighborhood basis as a point. So if you have a point and a section defined on the comp, on the punctured neighborhood, then um, you take the set of all P prime and then the same section as you said, and you take the collection of all such things for a fixed uh, P and U, then that I think gives you a neighborhood basis for this topology at that point. Okay, great. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's, a, it's a little bit, uh, okay, I, I think what I said is correct, but uh, Uh, okay, so this then uh, gives the, this gives us a notion of charge, and then there's a similar we can similarly to before define um, configuration section spaces where we uh, restrict the possible charges. Uh, okay, so oh yes, and for more details, it's in uh, section three of the paper, but I won't go through all of the details here. Um, <clears throat> 
So let's have some examples. Um, we can take uh, the tangent bundle minus the zero section. So this then means that uh, the interpretation is that we have a configuration together with a non-vanishing vector field on the complement. Um, we can also, for any tangential structure, so if we take some vibration theta over BOD, and we have a smooth manifold, and let's say that tau is the map classifying its tangent bundle, we can pull back theta along, uh, along tau, and that gives us a bundle over M, or at least a vibration over M, uh, such that the, the sections of this correspond to theta structures on M. And so if you take the configuration section space um, with this vibration, then the, it'll consist of uh, configurations together with a theta structure on the complement, like spin or, or framing or other kinds of uh, tangential structures. Um, then another one in a similar spirit is we could fix a principal G bundle over M, which is classified by some map to BG. And then a flat connection is a lift of this classifying map to BG discrete. And so equivalently, if we pull this back along F, uh, it corresponds to a section of this pulled back, pulled back bundle or, or vibration. And so using this, this vibration, we get the configuration section space of configurations with a flat connection defined only on the complement of the configuration. Um, <clears throat> then another more classical example is uh, Hurwitz spaces. Um, so a few weeks ago, you heard all about these uh, from Andrea. Um, if you take uh, just the trivial bundle over the two disk with fiber BG for some group G, um, then this, this is now just a configuration mapping space because it's just a map to the fixed space BG. Um, <clears throat> and a map from the complement of, of a configuration in the disk can be um, up to homotopy. It's just a homomorphism from the fundamental group of the disk minus the configuration to the group G. And this then gives you, uh, gives you the moduli space of branched coverings of D2 of, of the two disk. Um, and if you restrict um, the charge, what I called the charge before, this is now a set of conjugacy classes. It restricts them. It restricts the monodromy of this branch covering to lie in, set, in C. So in this set of conjugacy classes, and these are Hurwitz spaces, and they are somehow much more classical uh, uh, kind of spaces recovered by this definition. Um, <clears throat> and another example is um, if again it's a configuration mapping space. We take the space. We take the manifold to be d-dimensional, and we take the u. Um, eilenberg mclean space KZD. And so now, um, what extra data do you have apart from a configuration? Well, in a non-canonical way, you can... Uh, uh, I guess probably I should... Uh, let's assume this is a d-dimensional disk and not just any d-dimensional manifold, because otherwise what I wrote here is not quite right. But if we just take the d-dimensional disk, then the additional data you have apart from a configuration, um, it's essentially just um, if you deformation retract the disk minus a configuration onto a wedge of D minus one spheres, it's just a based map from a wedge of D minus one spheres to KZD. So it's just a list of uh, elements of loops D minus one of KZD, which is a circle. So in a non-canonical way, it's a configuration together with a, a circle parameter attached to each particle but it's somehow attached in a non-local way. If you move around these points in some way, there's no consistent way of actually attaching a circle to each particle. Um, <clears throat> and then I've written a sort of dotted arrow to the words magnetic monopoles here because somehow philosophically, these ought to be related to moduli spaces of magnetic monopoles, but um, I don't know a, really a way of making this precise at the moment. It's not literally equal to the moduli space of magnetic monopoles, but it's it may be related to a part of that moduli space. Um, okay, so those are some examples to show there's a, a variety of different um, settings that this definition can apply to. And then, so the main result is that under a certain condition, we have homological stability for these, these spaces. So for any, um, I didn't write it down again, but it can be any bundle over any manifold with non-empty boundary. 
uh, any connected manifold with non-empty boundary. If uh, the allowed charges are fully constrained, uh, this is actually quite a strong condition on the charges, and I'll say what it means in a moment. So it's a condition on this set C. Then this sequence of configuration section spaces with the stabilization maps that I defined before is homologically stable. Okay, so I owe you a definition of what, what this means. Um, so first, I'll say what it means in a case of configuration mapping spaces because it's a bit simpler. Um, so, so it's this. Uh, remember that C is a collection of unbased homotopy classes of maps from the D minus one sphere to X. This can be thought of as the quotient of the D minus first homotopy group of X by the natural action of pi one of X. So it has a surjection from pi D minus one of X. And the condition is that if you take the pre-image, it should be of size one. So another way of saying it is um, that C is a single element of this, which corresponds to a pi one of X orbit in pi D minus one of X of size one. Okay, so it's in a sense it's as, as constrained as possible. It corresponds to just a single element of the D minus first homotopy group of, uh, of the target of the mapping space. And you need to be a little bit more careful in the case of configuration section spaces. So in this case, this is, right, this is the idea. So if you remember, we, had, we have a bundle with fiber X and associated to that, we had this covering space of uh, local sections in a punctured neighborhood. And <clears throat> let's take a co-dimension zero ball near the boundary of M that intersects this, this uh, disk that we fixed in a boundary before. Um, and now if you restrict the uh, covering to that, of course, it's a trivial covering because it's over a contractible space, the ball. And let's also fix a trivialization. So it's just the ball B cross the fiber and the fiber turns out to be exactly this thing, unbased homotopy classes um, from SD minus one to X. And then if you take uh, a section of this covering space, this is was the more abstract notion of charge um, in the configuration section space setting. And if you just restrict it to the ball, that's uh, firstly, that's an injection. Um, just by basic covering space theory, because if uh, two coverings agree at a point, then they agree everywhere. So if you restrict uh, a set of, of sections of a covering space, then it's, this restriction is injective. Um, and this, in this way, we can view this, this set of charges C as a subset of just this, um, this set of unbased homotopy classes of maps from SD minus one to X. And then we apply the previous definition. So it should then, under this interpretation, it should correspond to a single element of pi d minus one of x. Okay, so this is a little bit involved, but maybe that uh, it's useful to remark that let's just take the case where x is simply connected. In this case, the condition is in every case is just that the cardinality of C of the set of allowed charges should be one. So we only consider uh, somehow one allowed charge of the whole coupled system. Okay, so <clears throat> since this looks quite restrictive, I just want to go through the previous examples and explain what it corresponds to in those cases and show that it's not, it doesn't somehow never hold or something like that. Um, so it, in the example of non-vanishing vector fields, um, in this case, the, the fiber of the bundle over M is uh, Euclidean space minus zero, right, the tangent bundle minus zero section. So it's, uh, D minus first homotopy group is isomorphic to Z. So it's just a D minus one sphere. And so in order to apply the theorem and to get homological stability, we need to impose a restriction on the allowed charges that corresponds to just fixing one element of this. And it's not too hard to see geometrically that this corresponds to prescribing the winding number. So you fix an integer K and you say that the winding number of the vector field around each singular point should be exactly K. And if you impose that condition, then the previous theorem tells you get homological stability for those kinds of uh, configuration section spaces. Um, so in the case of uh, tangential structures, um, the canonical kind of tangential structures to take are those 
given by the, the Whitehead Tower of, of BOD. So the K connected covers for different K. Um, and so for example, yeah, for example, uh, uh, K equals one correspond, right, corresponds to orientations, K equals two corresponds to spin, K equals four corresponds to string and so on. Um, and then just from, well, just from the fact that this is a K connected covering of this space from the long exact sequence, you see that um, the D minus first homotopy group of X is zero under this condition if K is at most D minus two. And of course, if pi D minus one of X is zero, then the condition in our theorem is automatically satisfied and you can just apply it to the full configuration section space. Um, so for example, if you look at a manifold of dimension at least four, then we can take K equal to two and take configurations with a spin structure on the complement um, and, and so on. Um, okay, so that's, that shows that um, in particular it does apply to uh, um, the example of tangential structures under some, some condition. The, the other example, the next example that I mentioned was about flat connections. So in this case, the bundle over the manifold is a pullback of this um, bundle, this vibration more precisely. Um, and so the fiber is X, whatever the homotopy fiber is of this, this uh, map from BG discrete to BG. Uh, from the long, long exact sequence, you see that all of the higher homotopy groups of X are the same as those of the topological group G. Um, and so, for example, if we take if we take three manifolds, so D is three, and if G is a Lie group, then the relevant homotopy group is pi D minus one of X, which is pi two of G, uh, but pi two of any Lie group vanishes. So again, in this case, the condition in our theorem is automatically satisfied and we get homological stability for, for these spaces. So in this case, it's um, configurations on a given three manifold with a uh, flat connection on the complement of a, of a fixed G bundle. Um, now in the case of Hurwitz spaces, we don't get, uh, we don't get very much. So it's a, quite a strong restriction in that case. Um, oh, I'll say this in a second. So in this case, um, C was a subset of the set of conjugacy classes of G. And so we had, uh, in this case, the Hurwitz space is the moduli space of, uh, branched coverings of the two disk. Um, uh, with deck transformation group G and with monodromy uh, constrained to live in C. And then the, this sort of fully constrained condition in our theorem forces us to assume that C is just a single conjugacy class of size one. So just an element of the center of the group. And this is, so in this case, it's quite restrictive. We don't, we do get some cases, we get, um, <clears throat> The cases where we force the monodromy to be uh, just in a single, a single element of the center, um, but uh, yeah, but it's quite a strong condition in this case. And in this case, there's a, a different theorem um, using totally different methods of Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and Westerland uh, from 2016, who proved uh, stability for the rational homology of Hurwitz spaces with a weaker condition on C. So I think their condition was that, uh, so in their theorem G has to be a finite group. C doesn't have to be a conjugacy class of size one. It can be a bigger conjugacy class and indeed it has to generate C. And then there's some extra technical condition about um, a non-splitting condition on this conjugacy class. And under those conditions, they proved that at least the rational homology stabilizes. Um, and from that, they proved uh, a version of the cohen lenz heuristics for, um, for function fields. So in this case, they had a purely number theoretical uh, corollary of, of their homological stability theorem. Um, <clears throat> but the intersection of our result with theirs is quite small because we only, we can only include the case where it's a, the conjugacy class is size one. Uh, and then finally, in the example that um, should somehow philosophically be related to moduli spaces of monopoles. Um, in this case, simply by definition, pi d minus one of the island bergman plane space KZD is trivial, and so the theorem applies directly. Okay, so 
these weren't sort of randomly chosen examples. They were chosen to show that there are actually cases that the theorem applies to. Um, oh, any, any questions before I go on? Um, I realize I probably went through all of these examples quite fast. So uh, I'm happy to slow down or go back or something like that. Um, okay. Um, but I have a quick question. So, uh, um, it's a weird question. So uh, when uh, so so in this, uh, it's, uh, I, I forgot what you call that. But when you fix the the charges by um, sort of looking at the sections of vector bundle minus zero section, so usually the order class pops out there somewhere. Uh, do you have something similar, or, or is it just? Be, I mean, that, that's just a question. I mean, it's weird. So I, I would have expected to hear the word Euler, word Euler class when you're looking at the uh, um, uh, vector bundle and removing the zero section. Uh, I, so I don't think so, but maybe, uh, maybe I have to think about this more carefully. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's just uh, that if you, um, maybe there's a shift by the Euler class or something like this. Um, I'm not sure, but um, maybe up to uh, maybe up to a shift. I think what I said is correct. That if you uh, if you want to apply the theorem and impose a condition that satisfies this sort of um, the, the condition of the theorem, it's enough to constrain the um, winding number around each singularity to be a fixed integer. I think. Okay. Yeah. That that, that makes sense. And then then the question you didn't say that so. Um... But you have no way of colliding these points or something. You didn't talk about that. Uh, that's not no. the point. That would be a very interesting thing to do, um, but it's not something that we've thought about so far about collisions. But uh, yeah, um, because then you, know, you have to. So, so the question is like, what what would the decay be? I mean, it's like because you're fixing a trunk class essentially or something like this, right? And then somehow the you know, if you have if you have a higher if you have a higher winding number, you could break it into two different winding numbers when you sort of pull these things apart. But yeah, so just thanks because yeah, <laughs> you asked for questions. I thought I we we we, we tried to think a bit about uh, about collisions, but it's I think it's it's a difficult question to work out what should happen uh, or what yeah how to define a notion of collisions for configuration section spaces. Uh, although I should mention that. Um, and well, maybe you saw his talk a few weeks ago, Andrea Bianchi has uh, defined uh, a space that is stratified. I think I have, he can correct me if I'm wrong because he's in the audience, uh, that's, that's somehow stratified by all the Herbert spaces and encodes a notion of collisions of particles for Herbert spaces. Right, yes. I don't know yeah. if that's... May, that's I, maybe may that I comment case. on this at the end? Maybe if we have time for discussion. Okay, sure. Yeah, um, and I'm sorry if I uh, if I gave the wrong uh, definition or something like this. Um, All right. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. So this, these are some examples that um, the theorem applies to, and then somehow the natural next question, if you have homological stability, is what is a stable homology? So. Uh, <clears throat> The, the next question on my slides. And in fact, this was um, in fact already answered earlier by Ellenberg, Venkatesh, and Westerland in the case of configuration mapping spaces uh, in their 2012 preprint. And um, well, to state it, I'll just assume that the manifold is parallelizable to simplify the statement. Um, and there, so the results gives the, the following model. So the stable homology of the configuration mapping space um, associated to a given manifold, a target X of the, of the mapping, and um, this condition C is the homology of the following mapping space. So it's a space of pairs of maps from the manifold comma its boundary to this um, pair of spaces. Um, and so this, this right-hand square is a definition of this space in the middle. It's obtained from X um, by taking the push out of this diagram. So let's see what this is. Uh, here we have the D minus one sphere across the space of all maps from the D minus one sphere to X that lie in one of these homotopy classes. 
and that's the evaluation map, and we take the inclusion of that into the D-disk across the same mapping space. So essentially taking this push out, um, you are in some sense killing every map from a D minus one sphere into X that lies in one of these holotopy classes in every possible way, and in a sort of parameterized way, parameterized by the mapping space. So it's sort of the maximum possible thing you can do to kill all of these homotopy classes in C. And by definition, the, the push out of this is, is this space called ADX, C. So this is defined by Ellenberg, Frank, Tash, and Westerland. And it comes with a natural map from X because X includes into um, this space where we've glued all of these, uh, these D cells. Um, and, and, then, and then the space that models the stable homology is the mapping space from um, M into this, uh, where the boundary has to land in the subspace corresponding to X. Okay, so it's some explicit mapping space that is then, at least in principle, uh, attackable by the tools of algebraic topology. Um, um, so yeah, just as a, a very basic um, but not so interesting example, I guess, is if, um, if the space X happens to be D minus one co-connected, so it's all of its homotopy groups vanish from D minus one above, then you would sort of expect not very much to happen because D is the dimension of the manifold and any uh, neighborhood of a point looks like a D minus one sphere. And in that case, this ADXC, um, assuming we take C to be the whole uh, pi D minus one of X, although in fact, yeah, if pi D minus one of X vanishes, so it automatically has to be, uh, then in that case, this is just the Cartesian product of X and the D sphere. So it's something not very interesting in that case, but if X has more interesting topology, then this can be a much more complicated space um, modeling stable homology. And um, well, since we were working not just with configuration mapping spaces, but configuration section spaces, we uh, generalized their theorem to give a kind of fiberwise version that um, essentially looks exactly the same, but it's uh, where everything is now a bundle over M. So the stable homology of the configuration section space for a given bundle over M is isomorphic to the homology of a certain space of sections. Uh, namely, uh, so associated to this original bundle, we construct a new bundle called ED. Uh, Psi C, which is essentially a fiberwise version of this uh, push out construction up here. And it'll be the space of sections of this bundle over M. And on the boundary, they should uh, take values in the original bundle E, which is a sub bundle of that. So again, it's some kind of uh, uh, section space of some explicit bundle that, that's constructed. Okay, but uh, I won't talk so much about the stable homology in this. In this talk, I'm, I, what I want to do instead is to give uh, the, a sketch of the proof and the, the ideas of the proof of the stability theorem. Uh, so unless there are questions, I'll go on to that. Okay, so, so now I'll give a, a very brief overview of the proof. So um, I'll do this just in the case of configuration mapping spaces for simplicity, but the ideas are basically the same for configuration section spaces in general. Um, so the basic idea is to use this, um, this fiber sequence given by, um, given a configuration mapping space, you can forget the field or the mapping and you just get a configuration in the interior of M and the fiber over a given point is just the mapping space. So we've pulled the configuration mapping space apart into the mapping space and the configuration space. Um, and then the stabilization map gives a map of fiber sequences like this. And the idea is to use the, the map of SAS spectral sequences associated to this map of fiber sequences. Okay, so this induces, um, <clears throat> first of all, a map of SAS spectral sequences, as I, as I just said. Um, and then also for any fiber sequence, you always have a monodromy action of pi one of the base on the fiber by homotopy equivalences. So in this case, we have a uh, monodromy action of pi one of the configuration space on this mapping space. 
which can be thought of as a kind of point pushing action because um, geometrically you can think of if you have a path of configurations moving around inside the manifold, you imagine you sort of um, put your fingers in the, uh, the punctures, Zn in the manifold, and sort of move them around and you pull the rest of the manifold around with it, just like the, uh, the point pushing map in the Berman exact sequence for uh, mapping class groups, for example. Okay, so that's a, somehow, it's an abstractly defined monodromy action, but it has a quite a geometrical interpretation in terms of this point pushing. And the first step is to show this extends to a functor on a certain braid category on M. So I won't give precisely the definition of this braid category, but it's, it's a certain, uh, it's in particular it's a category with objects and natural numbers and the automorphisms of n are precisely pi one of the nth configuration space on the manifold. Okay, so the monodromy actions give you a functor from the automorphism groups of this category, and what we have to do first is show it extends to a functor on the whole category. Um, and this is uh, closely related, this, this construction is closely related to the fact that um, if you take the disjoint union of all configuration mapping spaces for all numbers of points, then this forms a so-called E0 module over an ED minus one algebra. And I tried to copy and paste in a figure from the paper, but uh, I didn't do it very well, so it's a bit blurred. This is roughly a picture of how you can define this, uh, the ED minus one algebra structure is uh, on the top row when D equals two. So what does that mean? It means that if you have a uh, configuration of little disks on the one disk, which is this, and you have some configuration sections, which are these things, so the sections are given by the different colors, then you have to get a new configuration section in, uh, in the unit disk, and that's given by um, well, inserting you, you take this picture of a little one disks inside a one disk and blow it up a dimension into a little two disks inside a two disk like this. You insert these based on the, the labeling by one, two, and three. And then um, <clears throat> you extend by the base point everywhere except for vertically above these disks that you inserted where you extend it uh, by declaring that it's independent of the vertical coordinate. Okay, that's what sort of what these dotted things mean. So it's a little bit, uh, a little bit tricky, but this is, this is uh, the ED minus one algebra structure on um, configuration mapping spaces on the disk. And then by gluing this, um, gluing near the boundary of M, you can show that configuration mapping spaces on M are a module over that ED minus one algebra. Okay, so this, um, this construction of this, this, this de the definition of this structure is part of what goes into showing that we do have an extension to this, this bigger braid category. Um, but I won't say all of the details. And a I'm small Like what E0 modules mean? Like I assumed. Ah, um, like just modules. But maybe, yeah. So there is a. It's not, yeah, it's not so clear what. So this, this is the terminology that we used. Um, there. I guess one could just call it modules. There is a notion of EN module over an EN algebra, which is stronger than just being a module over an EN algebra. Um, so in some sense, you can, it makes sense to talk about EK modules over EN algebras for any K less than or equal to N, but it turns out these notions are all the same unless K is equal to M. So if K is equal to N, you get some kind of stronger notion. And if K is strictly less than N, then it's independent of what K is. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, we just called it E0 module because that's somehow a canonical thing. Um, yes, and then it's, uh, it's slightly more, s once, once you know you have this, this module structure of an ED minus one algebra, if D is at least three, it's essentially formal to show that you have an extension to this braid category because um, somehow everything is easier when you have at least an E2 algebra. If the dimension is two, then you only have an E1 algebra and it's a bit more subtle. 
um, and you have to worry about kind of conjugation effects like this. Um, but it is nevertheless true. It's not true that we have an, ED, uh, an E2 algebra structure, but uh, it's still possible to show we do have an extension to the, the corresponding braid category. Okay, so uh, I don't want to go into more technical details about that, but that's somehow the first step. That it, these monitoring actions extend to a certain a function on a certain braid category on M. And then the point of doing this is uh, uh, will be become apparent in step three. But first in step two, we show that um, if you then take this functor and compose it with homology in any fixed degree, then this is um, so-called a uh, functor that is polynomial of degree at most i. Yeah, I won't go into exactly what this means, but um, the point is that this is the one place and it's the key place where we need to use this uh, hypothesis that we made this strong restriction on the charges of the particles. Um, if we if we don't make that restriction, then um, well, I think we don't know that it's not polynomial of degree at most i, but we definitely are not able to prove it with our current methods, and so the, the proof would break down. So this is a, the point where we we critically use the hypothesis. And then a point of we're doing all of this is that um, we can then apply a, a theorem of Manuel Panich. And under certain extra conditions on the manifold, it would also follow from a, an earlier version that I proved, but his is more general, and we need his in general, um, that proves twisted homological stability for the ordinary configuration spaces with coefficients in this functor. Okay, but uh, the homology of these with coefficients in this functor, if you unwind the, the definition, is in fact exactly what we had on the E2 pages of the map of sphere spectral sequences. And so if you have stability on the E2 pages, you have stability in the limit. And that, that finishes the proof. So somehow all of the difficulty is it boils down to showing that um, the, the twisted homology of ordinary configuration spaces that appears on the E2 pages is in fact homology twisted by finite degree coefficient systems. Or well, first we have to extend it to the category on which it makes sense to define what it means to be a finite degree coefficient system, and then we have to show it really is finite degree. Um, and then once we have that, we can just input uh, twisted homological stability and a spectral sequence comparison argument, and that, that finishes the proof. Okay, so I have one more small topic, which is about when the stabilization map is injective, but I also can see that I'm I've taken 55 minutes, or maybe we didn't start at exactly half past minute. I'm sure I took at least 50 minutes, so I should probably stop here for now, and then um, I'll see what pe what questions people ask me, and maybe then I can talk about the last two pages. Um, <clears throat> okay, so thank you. Thanks for listening. Thank you for the talk. Maybe we can do a virtual clap. Hmm. So are there any questions or comments? Maybe I'm going to stop the recording. Uh, I've found that people feel more comfortable asking questions when